for participant information, as you've just probably um, heard here, uh, we will be recording this session today and it will be posted. Information about where the, the webinar will be posted as well as access to the slides and questions and answers uh, will be shared with um, individuals that uh, will be posting um, through longtermcarehomes.net uh, as our source of uh, information dissemination. And before we begin the presentation and how the webinar will be organized, I'd like to start off this session with a land acknowledgement. Okay, we would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, let's take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we all call home. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all uh, Inu Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this nation home. Let us also acknowledge that we are joining from the Office of the Ministry of Long-Term Care in Toronto, which is situated upon the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each in our own way move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Okay, thank you. Um, our session today will start off with a presentation on IPAC certification process from Sandra Callery, who is with IPAC Canada. This will be followed by a presentation, which I'll be sharing on IPAC funding, supporting IPAC education and training for the sector from the Ministry of Long-Term Care. We'll then pause for uh, taking some questions on the two presentations between 11.50 and 12 o'clock. After the Q&A session, we will continue on with the webinar presentations, uh, resuming our presentation, which will be co-hosted by Boyce Marufoff and Devin Metcalf from Public Health Ontario, as well as myself from the Ministry of Long-Term Care. Um, we'll then move into a second set of Q&As on, on the surveillance presentations. If we can move to the next slide. During our question and answer session, we'll be using the online tool Slido to have participants submit questions. The link was sent in the announcement, but it should also be in the chat box. Um, I think it should be entered in there. Uh, please go to www.slido.com and enter in the code hashtag IPACNOV23 which will bring you to our Slido page that we have set up. If we can move to the next slide. Here you can type in your questions. We ask that your questions please be focused on the content of the presentation so that we're able to answer as many questions as we can uh, related to the content as possible. You will have the ability to vote questions up in priority by clicking on the thumbs uh, up icon and we'll do our best to answer all the questions uh, as they come in, but if we are not able to address all of them, uh, we'll be reviewing the questions and trying to drop some uh, Q's and A's in a written response and uh, releasing that with the slides that are posted. Okay, so if we can move to the next um, session or the next slide, sorry. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to now introduce you to our presenter from IPAC Canada, who will be sharing information on uh, pathways to IPAC certification. Sandra Callery is our uh, past president and member of uh, IPAC Canada. She is, a cert she is the Certification Board of Infection Control President. Um, and she has also held a number of senior leadership uh, IPAC roles in various healthcare settings, such as acute and tertiary care and long-term care. Uh, she has also worked as an IPAC uh, specialist and advisor at PHO and is an assistant professor at McMaster University. So welcome, Sandra. We're really glad to have you here today. And I will hand on to you. 
Thank you very much. And hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, happy to be here today and to, um, as you can see here with both IPAC Canada and um, telling you a little bit more about the Certification Board for Infection Control. So on the next slide, you'll actually, um, if we can just move it along, you can see here, um, I've been certified, I still have my certificate, I've been certified since 1986. So have done this uh, quite a few times. And I quickly just want to say that um, it not only has value um, for the individual who takes certification, it gave me a good sense of pride. And the reason this envelope is there because I received, um, uh, surprisingly, I received a um, thank you note and an acknowledgement from the president and CEO of my hospital at the time. And I, I found this during COVID, I found the envelope again, cleaning out a closet, and it just brought back all the sense of pride and acknowledgement that was given to me at the time and how much it helped me in my career. And so that's just a little bit of my, the value for me, but I wanna point out the two articles that I've got uh, also on this slide, uh, one from 2019 and another one this past year that have both been published on the values of certification. One describes subjectively what it means not only to the individual, but to the organizations uh, those who employ people who are certified and those others and other stakeholders and how they see the value of certification. The second article actually looks at the impact of certification. And that study that was released this year demonstrated that those who have certified individuals leading their infection prevention and control program have um, implemented more of the IPAC uh, best practices and standards in their organization. And furthermore, the organizations have ensured that these things have been implemented and operationalized. So there is an influence that happens and a knowledge and understanding that goes along with certification. So I invite you to take a look at those for the future. If the next slide, I think it's really important to know that the true purpose of the CIC is really to protect the public. That's why we do this, is to protect the public by a standardized measure of essential knowledge that's needed for infection prevention and control professionals or practitioners. So on the next slide, I will tell you a little bit more about what we are. The certification board is voluntary, it's autonomous, it's at arm's length of other organizations, it's a multidisciplinary board. In other words, there are nurses, physicians, microbiologists, epidemiologists who all participate on the board and also for very various healthcare settings. So we have representation from both acute and long-term care on the certification board. And this board really uh, provides the direction for that certification process. So you can see here our, our current mission is providing pathways so that we can assess and maintain infection prevention competency with the true vision of healthcare without infection through a verifiable competency. So in the next slide, you can see all of our partners. Um, it's IPAC Canada, you can see is front and center as a partner, along with the uh, Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology headquartered in the US, and on an international scale, IFIC, the International Federation of Infection Control. So next slide. I want to just give you a quick review of the differences. We get questions about this all the time. The difference between a certificate versus certification. And there is a difference. So a certificate, of course, is awarded following the completion of a course or a series of courses or a module. It says you've successfully completed that educational offering or that training. And that's the certificate. A certification, however, is awarded following that successful completion of a comprehensive exam that provides an independent assessment of the knowledge. So regardless of where you've gone to university, where you've gone to college, this assessment is on the knowledge and skills and competencies you need to perform this role. And it's a certification exam that's independent of wherever you went to school and people are being assessed on the same level. So in the next slide, I wanna tell you a little bit more about our certification exams. So this one is probably the most um, recognized. 
the CIC, so it's the Certification in Infection Control. People write an examination for this, and they also um, recertify on a regular basis. So we have two exams, one that's for the initial certification, and then if you choose to recertify by examination, we have an, a separate exam for that as well. On the following slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about two new examinations that and certifications that people may not be as, uh, as aware. Certainly we have the Associate in Infection Prevention and Control Examination, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But I think the one that excites all of us here today is the long-term care certification in infection prevention. And we're calling it the LTC CIP. So on the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about that development cycle because you're thinking why this certification, why is it important? Well, we'll go forward with the next slide and tell you a little bit more about its, the due diligence. And I'll start by saying that this certification and the certifications through CBIC I have been accredited by the National Commission for Certifying Agencies. This is really important to know that um, we have gone through a due process. Um, they've looked at our standards, the implementation strategies. Um, it's, it's really um, given a lot of credibility to other organizations. So for example, the Canadian Nursing Association looks for certifications that have gone through this accreditation process. So it's important for us to be able to demonstrate that we're meeting those accreditation standards. On the next slide, you can see the exam cycle itself. So what we do every three to five years, we actually conduct a practice analysis. So we actually distribute uh, surveys across North America, so including not only Canada, but more specifically Ontario as well, um, practice analysis every three to five years to see how are people working in the field? What is covered in their, in, in their role and responsibility? And from that, we develop um, knowledge domains or where are the areas we should be testing. We start to write items for testing or questions, if you will. We assemble all of this together and package it up and we do beta testing on this. So there are those many um, who are in the long-term care field here in Ontario who actually volunteered for beta testing in the current exam. So they can, we conduct that beta test, set the passing score, and then there's an ongoing test maintenance. We have at least two exams circulating, so the questions are always changing and people aren't sitting beside each other writing the exact same exam. So there's an ongoing ex um, uh, cycle here that happens every three to five years. So it's very current to practice. On the next slide, we can, I'll tell you a little bit more about beta testing. So we have eligible candidates take a beta test version of the exam. We need at least 100 participants to do a proper evaluation. And from this, we use to we look at the cut score, and then we finally release that exam for daily testing. I will tell you that the beta testing for the long-term care exam, we had well over 200 participants. So a lot of participants and enough to make a good judgment on the exam itself. So the next slide will tell us a little, we'll go into a little bit more about this long-term care certification. And on the following slide, it we can you can see that we actually, in the middle of the pandemic, we actually completed a practice analysis. And you can see that we had 1,700 individuals who um, surveys were used for um, our analysis, both from Canada and the US, including Ontario. Um, they looked at their long-term care role responsibilities, and this provided us the insight and informed the knowledge uh, domains that we were going to use, and specifically in long-term care settings. So it created the test content outline, and all the test questions are based on this survey. 
and of course, based on um, evidence, but based on the roles and responsibilities of those who completed the survey. I, I really want to emphasize that it was developed with the same rigor as we've applied to the uh, existing CIC or certification. So on the next slide, you can see the content outline for this exam. We have long-term care settings. So rather than seeing questions around a neonatal ICU, you will see the, the setting being a long-term care home or a group activities or a chiropodist uh, office. So you'll see, and you'll see the words resident used rather than patients. We also have uh, content around management and communication, identification of infectious diseases, which is similar to any certification exam, surveillance and epidemiological investigations, the prevention and control of infectious and communicable diseases. And so this one's really covering knowledge and understanding of routine practices and additional precautions. The environment of care is around what happens at the resident bedside, the cleaning, the care, the maintenance, or any other spaces where we engage with the resident. Cleaning, disinfection, sterilization of medical devices and equipment is also covered. And many people have said, well, why we don't actually reprocess on site. It's not a question of whether you have a reprocessing center on site, it's whether you have the knowledge to know what to expect from that third party reprocessor who might be reprocessing on your behalf. So those are some of the questions that would be asked. Antimicrobial stewardship comes up very strongly for long-term care settings. And of course, employee and occupational health has a close working relationship. So that's the content outline for the exam. Next slide, we'll go into a little bit more about eligibility. Who's responsible, who's eligible for writing, for writing this certification exam? Well, the person who's been given that responsibility for the infection prevention control activities in your long-term care setting. So the, both the candidate and the employers fill out an attestation to this, and they also have to have um, completed post-secondary education in a healthcare related field. It's certainly not limited to the ones listed here. And if you're not sure, you can always reach out to us to see if that particular second post-secondary education is eligible. You can see that post-secondary refers to public, private universities, colleges, community colleges, and so on. Also, in addition to these, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the activities that would be expected of this person. So we should see this person carrying out many of the things you saw that will be tested on the exam. Are they identifying infectious diseases, reviewing lab reports? Are they carrying out a form of surveillance and epidemiology? Are they looking at ways of introducing routine practices, additional precautions, the environment of care? All of these elements should be things that they are invo involved with, responsible for, or collaborating along with others. They also, and the, you can see, um, although they may not be managing employer occupational health, there has to be a good working relationship and a collaboration there. Management communication and education and research. Any of those last three bullets, um, at least two of those three should be incorporated somehow into this infection prevention activity. So on the next slide, we talk about the application itself. The beta testing has just been completed at the end of October. We will have the results released to those who, um, those candidates in early January of 23. The exam then from there on in will be fully available for daily testing beginning on February of 2023. And the exam will consist of approximately 100, well, not approximately, will consist of 150 multiple choice questions. So the candidates who were, went through the beta testing will indeed, if they've passed, will receive certification. So on the next slide, and we can go ahead and just briefly tell you a little bit about the associate IPC exam. This is uh, an exam more for an entry level person measuring their very basic infection prevention competency. 
that's really intended for that novice ICP, those who might be interested in pursuing a career in infection prevention and control, and but aren't really ready or have all of the criteria. This certification is, is valid for three years and the intent is that they move on to certification after that. So the next slide tells you a little bit more about the eligibility for this. This one doesn't really require any job specific or educational requirements. It's really um, intended though for those who do have formal education, that post-secondary education without current work-related duties because the exam is set for someone who has some knowledge and understanding around the healthcare field. It is, we see, as a stepping stone to prove a candidate's foundational knowledge and to demonstrate to employers their interest and dedication to the field. Now, the applications, this exam has been reviewed and updated and released again, and applications for writing this exam will open in, on December 13th. So that just gives you an idea of the exams itself. I think the next slide goes on to tell you how um, they would be tested. They, the candidate goes through a company called Prometric. That's who we, um, who manages or administers our exam. It is based in the US, but in the next slide, you can see that this um, company is worldwide in 40 countries. It's available most days of the week, normal, normal business hours. And you can see that they would be proctored in um, a, a, a setting such as you see in the, in the picture here. However, especially with COVID, the next slide describes for us how they can take the exam at home. A live remote proctor locks down the candidate's browser. They do a 360 degree check of the, of the person's workplace and they can take the, the exam in the comfort of their home, which is great during this time. The next slide actually um, can tell us a little bit more about the CIC long-term care and CIP recertification. So these certifications that I've been talking about, the CIC and the long-term care CIP is valid for five years from the year of successful examination. Recertification then can take place thereafter. You can recertify in two ways. You could take an exam again if you, if you wish, but you can also start accumulating from the day you've, you've successfully passed the past exam to a, for the full five years, you could collect educational units and they can be applied for recertification. So there are two methods to stay fresh and current and which both are attractive to people for different reasons. And the next slide, just want to tell you um, how important it is to prepare and that you're not in this alone. So the next slide, I just want to emphasize our resources that we have. We have exam prep materials on the certification board's web website. These would be the actual uh, text correct, um, that we use to um, inform the exam questions. Um, so they all should be there for you as a reference point. We do also have podcasts and IPAC Canada has local chapters that are engaged in study groups to help people along and prepare them for these exams. The next slide actually tells you a little bit more about IPAC Canada and what a value this is to all of your ICPs and your organization as a whole. So IPAC Canada, this is a snapshot of IPAC Canada's website um, and how important it is um, for you and others to partner with them. If you go to the next slide, tells you a little bit more that where IPAC Canada um, the, might is there for you and links that you might find valuable. There's a PowerPoint presentation, um, a home page that of course gives you a lot to navigate, courses that are available through IPAC Canada, and of course um, they tell you more about certification and um, links to the C CBIC or the CBIC website. The next slide actually um, also shows you that IPAC Canada has a very healthy, robust interest group in long-term care. 
and I've, I've pointed it out here. So anyone who joins their organization um, will have opportunity to select that special interest group where you can dialogue with others working in the same field and where other experts can join in and support that interest group. So really, really helpful and they're there for you. So the last slide, I believe, is really just the contact information if you have very specific questions around CBIC or CBIC and criteria. And of course, um, the websites um, were just made available to you there for IPAC Canada. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Um, really appreciate all this great information. I'm seeing many, many questions coming into the chat box. Um, just also a gentle reminder for people to submit through Slido. So we're going to try to answer some of those questions in. Um, and I think Sandra will have a few directed to you and your peers um, after the, the next brief presentation. Uh, I'm now going to provide a, a brief update on IPAC training and education funding from the Ministry of Long-Term Care. And I'm wondering if we can go to the next slide. So on September 29th, the Ministry of Long-Term Care announced to the long-term care sector that approximately $26.2 million in funding would be made available to the sector uh, for homes on a per bed allotment basis for the purpose of IPAC training and education. And this funding is um, to be released to the ministry at the end of November, although I did see a, an announcement today come out on longtermcarehomes.net around the reporting piece. So please keep an eye on that. Um, of this funding, $10 million would be made available for a wide range of training and education strategies that would be made available to all staff in homes. And then there is an additional $16.17 million made available to homes to support IPAC certification of IPAC leads in order to meet some of the legislative and regulatory requirements. The ministry has um, set out some expectations and eligibility criteria uh, for the use of funding um, and the funding allotment uh, so that homes are able to meet uh, their own training and education needs and priorities. With respect to those wishing to pursue certification, up to $4,100 may be spent for individuals pursuing certification. And this can be used on uh, preparation courses, exam certification, uh, recertification. And it's, uh, it's with the expectation from the ministry that the homes do work collaboratively with their staff wishing to pursue this certification um, so that support can be provided. Wow. A uh, report back to the ministry is required on a quarterly basis um, and unspent funds will be reconciled at the end of the fiscal year. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So more specifically, funding for training and education is intended for a number of IPAC topics. Oh, sorry, here we actually have a window cleaner banging against our window here at the office. Apologies if you hear some noise. Um, the first topic is around IPAC principles. Uh, and this would include the basics and principles for IPAC uh, for staff, residents and visitors, outbreak prevention and management, um, the use of PPE, respiratory hygiene and hand hygiene, uh, the second topic would be on education and training to support compliance with the IPAC standard. And this might be with a focus in on um, education and training topics such as surveillance, IPAC program implementation and evaluation, practice and audit approaches, and targeted funding for advanced IPAC education um, that might be specific for IPAC lead, uh, the IPAC lead roles. There is also um, an area of funding uh, available for training and education of residents and caregivers, um, because we know uh, residents and, and caregivers um, are also part of a larger group that contribute to IPAC practices um, and awareness uh, and understanding of IPAC practices will also be important for this particular group and funds may be allocated to uh, providing that education for residents and caregivers. And finally, um, as I had mentioned, the funding available for certification and infection control. 
which I've outlined in the previous uh, uh, slides to meet some of the regulatory and legislative requirements for um, IPAC lead certification within three years of the Fixing Long-Term Care Act and its regulations coming into force. So these are the areas of focus. Um, this now brings us to the conclusion of the first part of our webinar, and we're now going to move into Slido to answer questions from webinar participants. My colleague, Lane uh, Elersich, and I will be facilitating these questions. Um, and we have with us to support answering some of the questions, um, Jackie Sweetnam, who is a manager here um, within the Operational Policy and Implementation Branch at the Ministry of Long-Term Care to answer some of the ministry-oriented questions. And our colleagues from IPAC Canada, Sandra Cowery, Jerry Hansen, and Zahir Herji, uh, who can uh, answer anything related to IPAC Canada resources and the IPAC um, uh, certification process. So, Lane, I'm going to hand yeah. over the first question to you. We're getting lots of thumbs up on some of these questions. I'd like to jump in on the right with the first one. Um, this question says, does the LTC CIP exam meet the requirements of the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, or should staff be encouraged to complete the CIC exam uh, um, by means of certi CIC certification? Um, Jackie, would you uh, like to feel that one? Oh, you're on mute, Jackie. Um, I sometimes have some issues with being heard on, on the screen, so I hope people can hear me. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, once the long-term care specific certification is fully available in Canada, we will be communicating to all licensees um, whether that certification will be considered acceptable to meet the requirement under the Act. However, we anticipate that it will be, um, and I'm going to also um, anticipate that there may be another question. It's actually a question that came through the chat pod. Um, another colleague had asked if an individual already has the um, the non, the more sort of general certification, um, will they also be expected to then complete the long-term care certification? And the answer to that is no, that we wouldn't expect an individual to complete so um, please bear with us. As soon as the long-term care specific certification is available, we will communicate to licensees uh, whether that certification will be considered acceptable to meet the requirement under the Act. However, we anticipate um, that it would be. And so, yeah, I, I'm so sorry. I, I I have this constant issue with um, uh, being heard on Zoom. People are saying that they're having trouble hearing me. But I hope you can sort of hear me. I apologize. Jackie, it, it does help when you lean in to the you computer know. to speak. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> it, it, so hopefully with the next question that comes your way, um, if you can lead in, uh, it, it certainly helps to hear you. Uh, otherwise, it is a bit broken. Um, so hopefully most individuals heard that response. Um, and uh, that there will be more information coming um, uh, around this. No, you would not need to uh, obtain both certifications. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, what's the requirements of the legislation? Um, again, more information will be coming, but we anticipate that it wouldn't necessarily be an issue for either the one. Correct, Jackie, from what I'm hearing? Yes, okay. Um, so the second question here, if you are certified in both CIC and LTC CIP, whoops, that question <laughs> jumped. Okay, stop voting. <laughs> <You didn't read. laughs> Would the recertification be the same or do you have to complete two separate exam education credits? Education. So mm -hmm. I will hand over to yes. one of our colleagues in IPAC Canada to answer this question. Well, I guess I'll begin, and certainly Zahir can add anything if I if I forget. But the the recertification exam is actually a separate exam. Um, it's not the identical to the initial one that you take. Keeping in mind that you're five years experience into the field, and so the recertification exam 
um, does expect a little bit more from someone um, when they're recertifying. Um, I just want to remind you that with in terms of the options, though, the educational credits are um, much, uh, people really do enjoy getting those. Um, they are um, easily obtained through um, sessions um, and educational offerings through IPAC Canada. Um, and I might pass this one over to Zaheer because he can really emphasize, he and Jerry, around what IPAC Canada does to help people meet their educational uh, units. Um, so over over to you, Zaheer. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sandra, and I'll, I'll um, ask Jerry to add if I uh, missed anything in. Um, so the your your IPUs can actually work for both certifications because of the fact that they're educational credits. You would actually be able to use them in both circumstances. However, the process of going through your recertification is separate for both of those certifications. So CIC is one, LTCIC is another, and when you go through to get certified, you would you would go separately. But you could use the same education sessions for both certifications. Um, the um, uh, through IPAC Canada, so there will be uh, the ability to be able to assess um, education that is offered through IPAC Canada. You can also get it through um, uh, the Association for Professionals and in Infection Control to be able to qualify either from the conference, so that'll be your education certificates from attending conferences um, or sessions through, uh, through the chapters or interest groups to be able to qualify for the IPUs. And in, um, there is um, much more clear information around how to go through and how to be able to collect IPUs through the Certification Board of Infection Control's website, um, which, will allow, which will allow you to be able to refer to all the different kinds of certification and what's required. Hopefully that helps. Jerry, anything? And I might add that. I just was Sorry. going to add that at Public Sorry. Health Ontario, they they provide grand rounds on a regular basis and other things that are also eligible for um, educational units. Excellent, thank you. Lane, do you want to take the next question? Uh, the next one at the top of our list is, uh, I think it's again for uh, CBIC. Um, how many times can you take the test? How long do you have to wait between attempts? Um, Sandra, would you like to? Uh, I think, and so here, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it has to be a minimum of 60 days, 60 to 90 days between taking the exam if you indeed have failed and then um, have to take and take it again. Now, if we're talking about a recertification, um, we actually have um, more details on our on our website around um, if you take the exam or if you decide to do collect the IPUs and the time frame of when you have to submit those in that final year of uh, before your certification expires. So, um, but if you do um, fail the initial attempt. Um, don't be discouraged. Um, you can, um, they usually send out some highlights of where you're struggling or where the areas that, uh, where you have uh, may need to look at or study a little harder. And you can do that again. And I believe it's between 60 and 90 days. Great. Thank you. So the next question we have, um, I think Jackie addressed the uh, acknowledging long-term care CIC as part of FLITCA, but the uh, one below it, if the ministry, oops, if the ministry accepts the long-term care CIP, will the ministry continue to accept the CIC as well? Yeah, we're getting a, 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 an affirmative on that. Um, wait for uh, the official announcements around the official availability uh, of the LTC CIP examination. Um, we will be providing some clarification and all of these questions should be uh, formally uh, answered at, at that point. We don't anticipate any difficulties with uh, having either and both uh, being uh, recognized. And I'll just hoping that people can hear me. I'm, I'm hoping that my voice is being picked up on the audio from someone's computer here. But um, so I did want to speak to that a little bit. The, for example, if someone has the, the sort of more generalist certification, we're not looking for people to repeat the work that they've done and to be recertified. Um, it's more that, you know, if someone wishes to instead pursue the long-term care certification, 
you know, we anticipate accepting that as well, but there will be no expectation that, for example, if someone has the existing CIC designation, we're not going to now come back and say, oh, then they also have to do the long-term care as well uh, when that is available. Great. I'm mindful of time. Um, we are a little bit over, so I think we'll just answer a couple of more questions and move on uh, with the presentation. Again, we'll try to review the questions and develop a Q&A and send that out uh, with our slides at a later point. Uh, next question is, can RPNs obtain the IPAC long-term care certification? certification. Yeah, um, short answer is yes, because they have a post-secondary education, um, and so that so would be eligible. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I do see if, another one about PSWs further down, so if I can answer that at the same time. That, unfortunately, is not in the same category. Now, however, someone who um, is a PSW and has an interest in long in infection prevention control may be someone who might want to consider uh, the AIPC, the associate IPC certification, which is not at the same level. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, and I appreciate you answering both questions at the same time. Um, the final question we'll take here, um, and Jackie, this will come back to us. How do we apply for funding for IPAC training dollars? Um, thank you. So I just uh, put in a response through the chat pod that um, licensees don't have to apply for that funding. Every licensee has received that funding. It was on a, a per bed allocation. So it may be that there might be someone else in your home um, who would have received that communication, whether it's your um, C CEO or director of finance or someone else can likely answer that uh, question for you but all licensees did receive a proportion of that funding on a per bed allocation. Excellent, thank you, Jackie. So on that note, um, I think we'll wrap up questions. Um, thank you, Sandra and Zahir and uh, Jerry, who was on the call. Um, we will be moving on to the next part of our presentation right now which will be focusing in on infectious disease surveillance uh, activities. Um, I'll be presenting on uh, requirements uh, and then we'll have our colleagues who will be joining us from Public Health Ontario um, to present more on how to do this sort of surveillance in long-term care homes. So if we could move to the next slide. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so many of you are likely aware of the legislative requirements uh, for IPAC under the Fixing Long-Term Care Act. Um, and we know while there were other IPAC requirements under the previous legislation, uh, when the Fixing Long-Term Care Act was developed, uh, we built on the previous uh, legislative requirements and augmented some of the IPAC requirements for the long-term care sector. Uh, based on a number of inputs, uh, such as um, commissions and third party reports, as well as uh, expert advice. Um, and these new additions, which can be found in the Fixing Long Term Care Act and its regulations and the IPAC standard, were included to promote a consistent and evidence based approach um, to practice. So, if we can move to the next slide, please. And again, I'll, I'll be fairly quick through these slides. The next few slides are specific extracts uh, related to the IPAC legislation regulation and requirements under the standards that are linked to surveillance activities specifically. I'll not be doing a line by line review, uh, but I'd like to speak to these sections in general um, as they do relate to the contact, content um, on surveillance that we'll be discussing and our colleagues will be presenting from PHO. Within the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, um, it's required that every home have an IPAC program in place. And within the program specifically, um, there is a component related to surveillance. And this is through daily monitoring to detect the presence of infections in the home. Uh, homes are uh, required to conduct surveillance activities each day to monitor and respond to any potential infections among residents uh, in the long-term care home and try to reduce uh, any risk of outbreaks. 
These surveillance requirements are just one piece of a larger puzzle to support effective IPAC measures in the home. Uh, these surveillance requirements um, are also outlined, some of them in OREG 24622, in particular Section 102. Um, and these details are uh, in, around surveillance include things like implementing surveillance protocols, which could be issued by the Ministry of Long-Term Care, uh, either for a particular communicable disease or a disease of public health significance, monitoring the presence of symptoms among residents, and recording them and taking immediate action. Um, and one of those action uh, tasks might be to isolate individuals. And this is all to reduce any sort of risk of transmission in the home. And then also to regularly analyze data collected, including daily analysis of screening information that's gathered, um, as well as looking at the data on a monthly basis to look at potential trends that might be occurring in the home. In the next few slides, we'll be going into a little bit of uh, detail with the IPAC standard for long-term care homes with specific requirements related to surveillance. So here um, we have the IPAC standard uh, requirements, and there are multiple sections that speak to requirements to surveillance in long-term care homes. Uh, in this slide, uh, the requirements speak to the surveillance section under 3.0, and key surveillance uh, requirements include staff training on surveillance activities, frequency of surveillance actions to be formed, performed in a home, use and understanding of case definitions, creating a database and reporting tools to support surveillance activities, recording this data, reporting requirements, um, and information dissemination among staff, because this is quite important when, uh, when conducting surveillance activities, and observing and tracking new symptoms among residents. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, section one of the IPAC standard focuses on requirements defined for staff roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities with respect to the IPAC program. And this includes communicating that such roles to staff. And this is really important uh, because part of staff roles may be to conduct some of these surveillance activities. And this might include identifying symptoms amongst reg residents, mm -hmm. documenting this information, reporting it and following through on uh, protocols or policies and procedures. Section four speaks to outbreak management requirements and specifically for surveillance related activities within outbreak management. This might include conducting risk assessments, acting on protocols for testing, screening and cohorting, communicating among staff this critical information related or found during surveillance activities, and having the IPAC lead and outbreak management team ensure information regarding what is being observed is tracked, documented, and shared with appropriate people. Section five of the standard has specific requirements for policies and procedures, conducting surveillance and screening activities, which would include data collection and reporting. And then if we can move to the Last slide here. And finally, section 11 has specific requirements related to screening for infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and other infectious diseases as stipulated. So as you can see, um, surveillance of infectious diseases is a very important component of broader IPAC activities and foundational to responding to um, emerging cases that have been identified or potential outbreaks. And there are requirements for surveillance that have been articulated quite clearly in our legislative and regulatory framework, as well as the IPAC standard. So on that, we'll move to the next part of this presentation. Uh, which will be presented by our colleagues in uh, from Public Health Ontario, Boyce and Devon, on surveillance of infections in long-term care homes. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our colleagues. Boyce uh, Marufov is a team lead from IPAC, uh, who is an IPAC lead from Public Health Ontario. Boyce is an experienced public health professional, and prior to joining Public Health Ontario, he worked at the Grand River Hospital and uh, the US CDC. He's also worked for a number of international health organizations. He has a master's of uh, science from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK, and a medical degree from the Samarkand State Medical Institute 
Institute in Uzbekistan. Boyce um, has also worked with the WHO in 2020 to support Eastern European uh, countries in the COVID-19 response. He has his certification in infection control and epidemiology and currently serves as the president of the IPAC, Central South Ontario chapter of IPAC Canada. We also have with us Devin Metcalf, who is an infection prevention and control specialist at Public Health Ontario. She has her BSc, MSc, and PhD in microbiology from the University of Guelph, and has recently obtained her Bachelor of Education with a focus in adult education from Brock University. Devin is a certified infection uh, control and epidemiologist, uh, or has her certification in infection control and epidemiology. She is an associate editor of the Canadian Journal of Infection Control, and Devin is also an uh, uh, is also adjunct faculty at the Department of Pathobiology at the University of Guelph. So welcome, Boyce and Devin. Thank you for for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much for introduction, Nancy. And uh, now I will be talking uh, with uh, my colleague Devin about the the surveillance. And it's not everything about surveillance. It is mostly giving you the uh, idea behind uh, the surveillance principles and where to start, what resources you have, and, and, and so on. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, and for the interest of time, let's move on if we can. So today we will be talking about a few important things. The first is what is surveillance and why it is important. Main principle and principles and components of surveillance. We will not cover all components as it requires a lot of time, but we will stop at some important components and share resources where you can learn about them. And the next, we will talk about what barriers and facilitators exist in implementation of surveillance in long-term care. And the last, um, we'll introduce you to IPAC Canada Long-Term Care Surveillance Toolkit and demonstrate a little bit how it works and uh, how it helps you to build the surveillance uh, program. And uh, when you talk about uh, surveillance, the definition of the surveillance is important. Uh, here you can see on the screen, um, this is from Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee, the PIDAC best practice document. And pay attention on uh, the words in, I made it in bold. And specifically on dissemination and action words. So I will read it um, because it is very important, um, very concise and important. So surveillance is the systematic ongoing collection, collation and analysis of data with timely dissemination of important information to those who require this information in order to take an action. So the action is the, the, uh, the big part uh, in this. And uh, moving next, um, uh, I will highlight that the PIDAC document is the, uh, the go-to document for us in it to establish, to improve surveillance in your home until we get uh, revised uh, and uh, something uh, comes new we will be uh, referring to this document. And another thing I wanted to highlight in here that uh, the measuring is very important uh, aspect of anything you do with surveillance and in, in, in long-term care. So in this context, it's a data collection of signs and symptoms of infection. So in order to improve outcomes and prevent or reduce infections or manage outbreaks, we should be able to measure it properly. So that's why if you can measure it, uh, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it and improve it uh, in terms of quality care uh, in a long-term care. And uh, uh, the, the next few characteristics of surveillance I want to highlight, the, the first uh, time is important to be able to initiate interventions as soon as possible in order to control the spread of infections. The second is representation is about to have an accurate picture of uh, different units, floors, shifts, weekends, different healthcare providers, et cetera, so that the data you collect is representative. So it's not about a single unit, particular uh, section of the home or particular professions like uh, collecting hand hygiene data, for example, from only PSWs. 
the sensitivity is, is uh, a big thing. Uh, and you, you should know that um, is about to, how to capture the, the infection. For example, with the UTI, you may not have typical signs and uh, symptoms due to some cognitive impairment. Uh, you can see a lot in long-term care and you need to find some sensitive ways uh, to capture the, the symptom of, uh, of that uh, person related to the UTI. And then the last is uh, specificity is the accurate data collection. It's using the same UTI example. It, how accurate is, for example, dysuria as a valid symptom for uh, the UTI? Uh, moving to the next, um, it is important to have a clear uh, case definitions in order to understand the dynamics and epidemiology of infections. And that's why these two definitions about the healthcare associated infections and what is the community uh, associated infections is important. And uh, we mostly, uh, you know, care about uh, healthcare associated infections and so-called also nosocomial infection in long-term care setting, as we cannot do that much uh, within our uh, uh, setting. Uh, about the community care, uh, community associated infections, and that is the responsibility of uh, public health authorities usually. So moving next uh, about the case definitions, I want to highlight a couple things in here. So one is that um, what uh, is uh, fever, for example. So everyone uh, may have a different understanding and a measurement around the fever, so to be on the same page and compare apples to apples, it's better to have actual number, for example, like uh, 80, uh, sorry, 38.1 Celsius. So in contrast to conventional comparison, um, this, I put this picture of uh, red appearing fruits doesn't mean that they are the same. And uh, the next is another example is uh, diarrhea versus water stool. There is a definition of waterly stool in case definitions versus diarrhea. And so the point here is that we need to be consistent and clear about uh, the case definitions uh, we use. Uh, moving next, I will talk about some components of um, uh, the surveillance. So as you see in your picture, there are uh, six of them highlighted here. But I uh, took a, a freedom and um, you know flexibility to add one more, which should be integral part of everything in here, which is education. So I'm not going to read everything from here, so you can see on your screen, and, and it's in, in the same document um, I uh, referred before in, in the PIDAC document. And uh, moving into the next, I will talk about uh, education uh, a little bit, importance of education. So um, you, you know that education in everything is important. Um, in infection control, it is in two components. So one is about the education of uh, IPAC lead. Uh, we call in general terms, uh, infection prevention control uh, professional uh, on uh, data collection, validation and reporting. Then the second part is about educating the frontline staff and, and others who collect the data and uh, orientation of them, and also if anything changes, um, you know, uh, bring uh, into their attention to orient on, on those new changes. And also monitoring rounds by the IPAC lead on the floors and answering some questions. And also important uh, component is in-person uh, meetings and, and, and the feedback. Uh, the next, we will go to the data collection part, which is um, in, uh, uh, terms of surveillance divided into two um, ways. And these methods, whether we talk about the active surveillance or passive surveillance, and you see the differences in there, uh, it should be consistent and, and, and simple and explained and, and oriented uh, to, uh, you know, to the staff. A total chart review of, of residents or patients, it's not recommended. And they use the best method um, uh, which fits you. And the, the big difference between the active and passive surveillance is that as you see in the little picture there is you will be able uh, to find much more um, underwater, uh, you know, uh, kind of signs and symptoms not recognized on a, uh, 
uh, on the surface. So it is basically you go out and actively sick for uh, some signs and symptoms of infections versus in the passive, you just wait if someone reports to you, uh, so to say in a simple way. And uh, the next is the communications. I put the, um, uh, you know, uh, the language here from the same PIDAC document, which is if surveillance data are not used to affect the changes in IPAC practices, then the surveillance system is not working. It is pretty uh, uh, kind of straightforward and basically even hard, uh, um, you, you know, statement, but that's what it is. And you need to know your audience in, in that communication, focus on main messages, make uh, and, and different charts and then visually appealing um, pictures and, and graphics so that let data speak on your behalf and provide recommendations uh, for actions. The another component I want to talk about um, uh, is not the component that actually the, the issues we have, oh, sorry, it moved forward one, okay, uh, is what we know and, and what barriers and uh, facilitators we have uh, in implementation of surveillance in, in long-term care. So number one, and I highlighted in, in the bold is, and you know more than me, of course, that competing priorities, right? It's a lot out there. And especially we um, faced that a lot during the pandemic. And, uh, and, and we heard this also from the, the small project we, we run uh, in Public Health Ontario with uh, one uh, long-term care corporation. It's about the 18 homes we did. And this is what we heard and also what we heard during the pandemic combined into this slide, which is uh, you know, in front of you. So relatively new area of practice for many of you. Some could be for a long time already in IPAC field, technical and knowledge, implementation challenges, not, uh, not sure where to start and where, where to get the resources and also uh, the buy-in uh, from the nurses and, and other stuff on surveillance and specifically on, on, on daily shifts uh, about the data collection. But we have some good facilitators, which is one we, which was shared just before me is about the existence of legislative requirements, which was not in that uh, um, you know, detail uh, before uh, it was released dedicated IPAC lead, which is also uh, highlighted in the legislation experience of COVID-19 pandemic. So a lot of us uh, have that experience and it helps. Uh, easy to use surveillance toolkit, which will be now uh, presented by my colleague, integration of daily surveillance into the resident safety and quality of care and uh, support from uh, newly established IPAC hubs, Public Health Ontario, and public health units. And then the last, I want to share just this one slide and then uh, the graph you see in front of you, it is about how much time based on our that uh, the small project we had with 18 homes, when they established, uh, when they started establishing the surveillance activities in their homes, how much time they spent on surveillance uh, from the beginning after three months and after 10 months of surveying them in terms of you know how many hours per month. So in the first, uh, you see first column, they spend an average of 22 hours in uh, after three months. In the beginning was a bit challenging. They spent a lot of time, but after 10 months, it was much more better. They spend an average of uh, seven hours a week, which is much better when they uh, establish the systems, uh, things going well, and um, this will be also with the help of the surveillance toolkit, which we're gonna introduce to you now. And um, the next is uh, my colleague will be uh, uh, sharing with you uh, that uh, surveillance toolkit, Devon. Okay, uh, thanks boys. So I'm sorry, I just advanced a little bit too far here and I'm not sure how to go back. So that's okay. Um, I was just going to uh, talk to everyone today about surveillance tools and one toolkit in particular. Um, so this one is a collection of tools that was initially developed and trialed by Public Health Ontario in collaboration with the Long-Term Care Corporation a few years ago and has since been made available through IPAC Canada. So all of the tools I'm talking about today are freely available on their website, along with some supportive resources such as webinars. We'll be providing links to everything in this slide deck. 
So this toolkit was developed with the intention of providing resources and tools that can help long-term care homes establish a manageable and consistent surveillance program. So the tools can make the process a lot easier by outlining key steps to follow and what are the tools will assist you in your data analysis. So I'll just walk you through some of this toolkit and show you how uh, you can use them to support your surveillance program. So this image is the cover of the Long-Term Care Surveillance Toolkit Guide. So one of the elements of this toolkit is this comprehensive guide document that provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to use all of the components listed here. So I won't go over all of these. I'll just focus on a couple, but I encourage you to visit the IVPAC Canada webpage where these are housed and you'll find lots of information on each of them. Okay, just to show you some of the components of the toolkit up close. So this is the daily surveillance form. So you can use this to create a list of residents who are experiencing signs and symptoms of infections. So entering in their name and checking off what the symptoms are that you're concerned about. There's also a column for indicating if a specimen was sent to the lab and when the infection is considered resolved. So you can use this form in a couple of different ways. So it can be used as a communication tool. So from shift to shift, staff will easily be able to see who has been experiencing anything concerning. It can serve as a bit of a flag for the IPAC lead if you're suddenly seeing several residents with new onset of the same signs and symptoms of infection. It's important to note that this form does not replace documentation in the progress, progress notes or the residence charts. It's just intended to be a summary of the basic signs and symptoms. And it can also be used for some accountability. So at the top here, there is a section for staff initials. So on every shift of every day, so the D, E, and N stands for day, evening, and night shifts, someone can be signing off indicating that yes, all the residents have been monitored and this list has been reviewed, ensuring continued communication and awareness. So some homes have taken this form and used the general idea of it and integrated it into their own system as an electronic version. So there is an electronic flag of all residents being monitored for infections. So you can use these tools as they are or integrate them into your own system, adapt them or recreate them to best suit your needs. So as Boyce mentioned, it's really important to use validated and standardized case definitions. So case definitions are the standard set of criteria used to classify your residents as a case. So you want to ensure that these definitions are applied consistently, ideally, so even if someone else stepped into your role, they would be able to classify the same residents as cases. So we used these definitions in the toolkit. Uh, so this is the surveillance definitions of infections in Canadian long-term care facilities published in 2017. The authors developed a set of definitions for all common infection types and for constitutional criteria, such as fever, acute functional decline and acute changes in mental status. Ideally, you want to choose definitions that are specific to long-term care. There are sets of acute care definitions, but they might focus on infection types that aren't as relevant to long-term care, such as ventilator-associated events or surgical site infections. So regardless of whether or not a resident is exhibiting signs and symptoms of an infection, they'll only be counted as a true case if they meet the case definition. So here's just an example of a case definition that appears in the document mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so I picked a fairly straightforward one. Some of them get a little bit more complicated, but this is the definition for basic gastroenteritis. So it doesn't include norovirus or C. difficile infections. They have separate definitions. So in order for a resident to meet the definition for gastroenteritis, they just must meet the uh, following criteria. So we do have case uh, validation forms as part of the toolkit, which will actually help you practice applying these case definitions uh, so just for as long as you need them until you get used to them. So for all of the inf residents on your list that you're concerned about having a suspect infection, you want to pull up the case definition for each of these to determine if the resident actually does meet the definitions. Okay, so this is my favorite part of the toolkit. So this is a really useful tool. So as I mentioned, uh, this is an Excel file. I know it looks complicated, but it's quite straightforward to use. So even if you aren't sure about this, I would encourage you to download it, play around with it so you can learn about its features. So you'll see at the bottom, there are several different tabs. So one is just a basic introduction. One is a glossary of terms and one is for instructions on how to use the tool. So everything you need is right here. So there are separate tabs for entering general infection data and then one specifically for antimicrobial resistant organisms, which has some slightly different considerations, which I'll tell you about more in a moment. 
So to start, you would download this file, save it. You can start a new file every year. Depending on how big your home is, there is a limit to the number of lines uh, to enter resident data, but it's quite a lot from what I understand. So you aren't likely to exceed it in a year. So you see here that the infection types are color coded and grouped together. So respiratory infections are blue, gastrointestinal infections are orange and so on. There are two columns at the end that are pink that are optional. So if there was a particular infection type not listed here, that is a concern in your home, you could add it in. So this allows you to customize the tool to better suit your needs. So it was developed before the pandemic. So certainly COVID-19 could be added as one of these options, but you can tailor it to your home. So to use this form, you basically just have to enter in the information. So taking a closer look, this is just the left-hand side of the tool. So you can enter in your home name, the year, and start to enter your data. So we would recommend filling this in uh, at least once a month, more possible, uh, to ensure it isn't too much work all at once, and you're able to see what is happening in your home with respect to infection rates. So you indicate the month using the drop down box, then the resident name and other information you need to identify them. So we have unit here. So that could mean floor, wing, whatever you have in your home. And that's a free text box. So you can type in the appropriate information, then the room number, date of symptom onset. And so that's where you're gonna to have to go back to the resident's chart or the daily surveillance form. And you'll also indicate whether or not this is considered an HAI. So that's a healthcare associated infection or an infection attributed to your home. So remembering back to what Boyce was talking about in the earlier slide, this is an infection where based on the timing and circumstances, the resident likely acquired it within your home. So moving along the tool, there is a column for indicating whether or not this resident has a fever. So you enter in the numerical value of the highest temperature of the resident uh, or that the resident had and anything over, I think it's 37.7 is automatically appearing as a yes in the column beside it. And this is just to help you apply case definitions because some of them have the presence of a fever as a criteria for the case definition to be met. And then you just put an X for the type of infection the resident had. So you'll need to use the case definitions for this. And as mentioned, there are the case validation forms that help you work through the case definitions if you need them. So you want to ensure that the resident meets the definition, simply enter an X in the column for their infection type. So I believe for the first three lines here, we're looking at the month of January. So for January in this home, there were three HAIs or infections attributed to the home. So two for respiratory infections, and both of them happen to be influenza-like illness, and one was for a urinary tract infection. And here UTIs are differentiated based on the presence or absence of a catheter. So moving over to the other tab, this will appear on the total INF tab. So that's referring to total infections. So here you will find that automatically a two shows up in the January column for respiratory infections and a one in the UTI column. So this is automatically carried over. You don't enter anything yourself. At the bottom of this table, you will see the total case counts for the year for this infection type. And here you will give you an idea of what it looks like. We're just showing you a few months worth of data. So it's important to note that only HAIs appear in this table. So if you enter no in the column for was the infection an HAI, the case will not appear here, only HAIs. And below it, a graph is automatically generated. So the bars are color coded showing what portion of the bar is representing what infection type. So respiratory infections are blue, UTIs are yellow. So these tables and graphs can be copied and pasted into reports to share the results with whoever you want within your organization. So on the same tab, the total INF tab, you will find this table and graph. So this is where the rates are being calculated. So the other table and graph are showing case counts, and this is where you will find the rates. So there is math required to calculate the rates. I'm always happy to have the process automated because it helps prevent math errors that I'm inevitably going to make. So the rate here is an incident rate, meaning it's the number of new occurrences of this infection type over time. So I will run, uh, I do have a quick uh, example of how to calculate it. I'll see if we have time to do it, but um, it's all actually done here within the tool. So what you do need to do uh, in to enter into this table, however, are the resident days. So this is used as the denominator for the calculation. So resident days, uh, if anyone's not familiar, just refers to the total number of days all residents are present during the month. So that is the time period they're at risk for developing an infection attributed to the home. So for the month um, of January, we've got 31 days. Each resident who is present the entire time contributes 31 days to the total. If a resident was a new admission and didn't come into your home until halfway through the month, they would only contribute 15 or 16 days to the total because they weren't at risk of getting an HEI attributed to your home until they arrived. 
It's important to use accurate resident days to ensure that you can compare case counts month to month. If you have a drastically different number of resident days one month to the next, the significance of a certain number of cases might change. Okay, so looking at resident days because it's such an important number to have, you may not have to calculate this yourself. Hopefully you don't. A lot of organizations will have this number handy at the end of the month through staff who take care of finances, or you might have a program that easily tallies this at the end of the month. In a small home, it isn't too difficult to calculate, but for larger homes, there is if there is some turnover residents with new admissions or transfers out, it will be easier to see if you can get this number from somewhere. So just in the interest of time, I won't go through this example today, but when reviewing these slides later, if you have any questions about about this, uh, please contact us. Our contact information is available on the last slide. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. And again, I was just going to show you another example here of how to calculate an incident rate, but this is done for you in the toolkit. Um, so I was just going to outline the steps, but again, happy to chat with anyone who isn't clear about this calculation later. Uh, just reach out to IPAC at PHO. Okay, so back to this table and graph. So you've calculated your resident days, just pop that number into the white box beside the month in the table and the rates will automatically be calculated for each type. At the bottom of the table, uh, there is an annual average is calculated, allowing you to compare averages from year to year. So this graph is great in that it will show you the rates for infection types month to month. So you can see how you're trending. Are certain types of infection starting to creep up or did you see an unexpected jump or drop in your case numbers? These are flags that you need to investigate further. And you can copy and paste these tables and graphs into reports and share within your organization. And on the reporting tool, there's another set of tabs specific for surveillance of antimicrobial resistant organisms. It's a process similar for these compared to other infection types. There are columns specifically for three common types of AROs. So uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, vancomycin resistant enterococci, and the carbapenemase producing members of the uh, Enterobacteriaceae family. The reason they're on a different tab is because the table allows you to indicate whether or not the resident has an infection or is colonized. So as you may know, a lot of cases of MRSA, for example, are colonizations, which are still important to recognize and track and implement precautions. So these tables allow you to specifically monitor these types of cases, but you will get the same automated calculation of rates and generation of graph for both infections and colonizations. So now you have all this great data, what are you going to do with it? So there are a couple of benefits to having it. Uh, you'll be able to monitor trends over time, identify whether or not any rates are increasing or decreasing. You see a change from your baseline, you can investigate what's happening. You can look at rates over time. So for example, if you know you usually see a spike of respiratory infections in the winter, you can monitor these spikes year to year to see if you can implement early interventions to try to bring them down. You can also gauge how effective your current IPAC practices are, but if you identify an infection type you'd like to target with a new IPAC intervention, monitoring rates will tell you whether or not these interventions are working. So if your home is using the same case definitions as other homes, you'll be able to benchmark your rates against theirs to see how they're faring. And if you see a spike in the number of cases of your rates, that could indicate there is an outbreak or something brewing, so again, worth investigating. And you can also consider if there was some sort of change. So does this spike coincide with a change in testing, a change in case definitions? Is there something that has happened that it could explain why there are more cases or is this truly transmission occurring in your setting? And finally, regardless of your numbers, you should share your data within your organization. So even if it's good news, so even if you're sharing really low numbers or a big improvement to a rate compared to the month before, it's great for morale, letting people know that they're doing a good job. So being able to share your data, not just verbally, but also visually in the form of graphs can really highlight your key messages in an understandable way. So this can be shared with your IPAC committee at meetings or in the form of reports with leadership and decision makers, and it can be shared with specific resident care areas. So if you notice that cases of a particular type of infection are clustering on a particular floor, you can make sure you work with staff there to address the issue. And I just wanted to quickly mention this PHO resource. So this is a checklist for IPAC leads in long-term care, specifically those who are new to the role. So it provides some resources and professional development uh, directions to build your IPAC knowledge, skills, and abilities. It's divided into sections and there's an entire section on surveillance. Uh, so this links to a lot of resources to help you assess your current surveillance program, identify areas for improvement, to strengthen it. This is available on the PHO webpage that houses resources specifically for new IPAC leads in long-term care. So there's also recorded orientation webinars that address a lot of the topics covered in the checklist. There's one specifically for surveillance. 
So the links will be provided in the slide deck. And I just wanted to highlight a couple other important resources, the links of which you will have here. So here I provided a link to a recorded webinar about the IPAC Canada Toolkit we discussed today. So it's an introductory webinar that goes into a bit more detail about using the toolkit and it's posted on the IPAC Canada website. It's freely available to everyone. So even non-members, you should all have access to it. And as I mentioned, PHO has recorded webinars as part of an orientation webinar series we did recently, and there was an entire webinar dedicated to surveillance. So it's some great basic step-by-step -step information on how to approach a surveillance program if you're newer to the role of IPAC and surveillance in your home. There's also a great recorded workshop available through IPAC Canada that gets really detailed in how to perform surveillance. It includes details about how to set up a program, how to identify priorities based on your resident population, and works through some really practical exercises in applying case definitions. So practicing calculation of rates and creating and interpreting epi curves and communicating the results and analysis. So it gets into other types of calculations as well that you might find useful. So this would be great if you're interested in going a bit deeper. So it is, however, only available to IPAC Canada members, but if you're a member, I would encourage you to look into it. And of course, the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee's best practice document on surveillance, a lot of really great information in there. Oh, I think it's trying to open the link. Oh, I'm seeing a frozen screen. Is anyone else seeing that? Yes, it looks like it. Okay, so I think um, the next slide was probably going to be a poll that we were going to skip anyways, and then it was just going to be my summary, so I can just do that really quickly. Uh, so just to summarize uh, things we talked about today, surveillance of infections is an essential part of a robust IPAC program in your home and how the data collected as part of your surveillance program can be used to implement and assess IPAC initiatives. We recognize significant barriers uh, to implementing a surveillance program, such as competing priorities and a lack of familiarity with processes, but hopefully focusing on facilitators and finding support through your program can help. And uh, hopefully you can use existing resources um, like the toolkit so we can help make it a bit easier to stay organized and analyze your data so you can use it to make improvements in your home. And you can always connect with PHO as well. Um, at the end of the slide deck, we shared our email address for our IPAC team. So if you've got any questions about surveillance or IPAC practices in general, please reach out and an IPAC specialist can help you. And with that, I think we are happy to take some questions. Thank you, Boyce and Devon. Uh, really appreciate this great presentation on surveillance and long-term care homes. This now brings us to the conclusion of the second part of our presentation, and we'll be moving into Slido questions again. Um, and so uh, Boyce and Devon will be responding to questions from Public Health Ontario, while uh, Jackie Sweetnam will be answering MLTC-related questions. Um, so, Lane, maybe you can start with the first one. Yeah, we're getting a lot of votes for a question that says, how does this Excel tool compare to what the Point Click Care Infection Prevention Control Dashboard uh, does? Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sandra or Devin uh, if you could um, let us know if you're familiar with the Point Click Care Dashboard and, and if you can offer any comparisons to the Excel tool. To the uh, yeah, so I can I can certainly start. Um, so I'm not overly familiar with it. I haven't actually used it, but I am familiar with some homes that do use it. Um, and so and I've heard, you know, very positive things about it. So, I, you know, if it does have some of those features where you can track infections and analyze your data, then, then that's great. You know, whatever can help you streamline the process. A, a home I uh, was familiar with who used it said it could it did do some of those features and it did allow um, some kind of electronic flagging of, for the daily surveillance uh, for any residents that um, did show signs and symptoms of infection. So someone could go in and see all the flags and, and get a good sense of that. So absolutely, like whatever works for you, if you find that something that works. Um, the toolkit we were mentioning, you know, would be great for a home maybe looking to set up a system. So a home that currently doesn't have one, looking for a no cost toolkit that can help them get started. And as mentioned, um, you know, there might be parts of this toolkit you could use that might complement um, point click care or, uh, you know, so you don't have to necessarily use all of it. So really, you know, we're happy with whatever, um, helps you do surveillance properly. Sandra, I don't know if you had anything mm -hmm. to add. 
Um, I'll just add that and certainly when um, when I was working in my long term care sector, we had point click care. Um, it does focus a lot on syndromic surveillance and we do, had to do an awful lot of adaptation. I think what you're offering with the toolkit is an opportunity to, to bring all of the information together because um, for want of a better term, um, it was individuals information and it wasn't necessarily gathering it all together so you could see if I truly had an outbreak or not. Um, I think there are additional now, um, it's since I haven't been using it in the last little while, I think that there are other features with point click care, but you've um, most importantly pointed out that it comes with a cost um, because these are extra modules and additions. So I think that's what you have to weigh as an organization. But whatever you're, whatever people are using and using properly is the way to go, right? Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Okay, we'll move to the second question, uh, which I think part of this was answered during your presentation, Devin, but um, maybe just a quick reiteration. And if Sandra or um, anyone else would like to, like Zahir to, or Jerry to add about this uh, information on courses or training, is there information in training resources on best ways to collect and analyze the data for surveillance? Uh, so I can just start by pointing um, everyone to, you know, there are some PHO resources, as I mentioned, some specific for, uh, you know, orientation. So people new to long-term care as IPAC leads. I think Jerry put in the chat box there that there is going to be a two-hour workshop on surveillance and long-term care in January. The one that is currently available, uh, post on the website, um, is, is really, really well done. Um, I think, you know, probably being there live and being able to kind of work through those practical examples uh, would be great training as well. But between, you know, PHO and IPAC, Canada, I think there's uh, there are a lot of great resources available, and we did link to some in the slide deck. And if anyone from IPAC Canada would like to add anything to this. Uh, hi, it's, it's Jerry. Thank you for that, Devin. Uh, yes, we will be holding a workshop in January. The recording of the previous workshop is available on our website. Uh, it's available for anyone, member or non-member, but we will be repeating the workshop and having updates in January. Great, thank you. Um, I'm mindful of time. We have a couple of minutes, so I'd like to focus on the last couple of questions and then we'll wrap up the rep webinar. Um, Lane, do you wanna yes. take this uh -huh. one? We have a question asking, will the Excel spreadsheet tool be updated uh, to include COVID-19 or uh, the, the person asked the question or as an other, or should it be included under respiratory? Um, how are how are our homes to use the Excel spreadsheet right now to accommodate uh, tracking for COVID-19? Uh, so, uh, I, yeah. Oh. Sorry, right, sorry, I can start. Um, so COVID-19 can be added in as, as kind of that other optional uh, one just for specific tracking of that. But the uh, IPAC Canada Surveillance and Applied Epidemiology Interest Group has now assumed responsibility of it. So boys, I think you're a part of that group. Has there been any discussion about uh, updating it? Um, not specifically uh, making a, a COVID-19, but uh... Uh, there was a uh, couple empty, um, you know, spaces in that Excel sheet that you could put uh, any other infection of your interest. So it could be at a time we considered that, as uh, you remember, uh, a while before that, it, now the COVID is, is the one, uh, the monkeypox could be another thing, just an example I'm saying, right? There could be any other emerging infection. So there are, uh, that there is an option to include that, uh, you know, one specific infection of your interest, in this case, COVID, into that, uh, into that form and, and, and track it then appropriately. Thank you, boys. Thank you, Devin. Um, do you think we can fit in one more question? It is almost one o'clock. Yeah, I can, I can address this, the, the, the question uh, I see on, on, on the top, which is who needs to do it, right? Uh, while we are not in the position of uh, telling you who exactly, because you know it is a decision making within the home and every organization they have their own way of doing things. But in general, the uh, you know the picture we see that you know the daily surveillance of residents should be done by a nurse um, who does that the checks on residents anyways at least once a shift, right? 
So when these rounds uh, done by the nurse uh, going through the, the floor and doing that, that those checks with the, the residents, um, collecting data on surveillance could be, uh, you know, the, the added one on have in mind that uh, in, uh, she may or he may have a, a spreadsheet um, with the, the, uh, uh, the questions asked and that may help. And always, you know, um, uh, it could be, um, uh, you know, discussed within the home. Maybe you may dedicate someone else specifically for those rounds and it is decision of uh, every home. But that data collected should be then transferred to the IPAC lead who will do the all the analysis, collation, uh, uh, and uh, the reporting uh, and, uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I could just add to Boyce's comment that it's be making sure that you stay true to the case definition. So you make sure that whoever's collecting the information has been trained with those case definitions to, ca to capture things appropriately. Yeah, yeah. As as I mentioned earlier, the uh, education and ongoing refresher on whatever the changes coming up is is key. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, it's, it's Jackie here, and, and I want to apologize. I'm I'm not meaning to contradict my PHO colleagues, but um, and there's a STEM issue, but just to say that our legislation doesn't require this to be done by a nurse, and that. Um, please have a look at what's required under the act in terms of the requirements for the surveillance on every shift. I want to make sure that we're not contradicting anything in our legislation. Thank you. Okay. Um, are you able to? I'm hearing that. You're on mute, Nancy. Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, we're not able to answer the rest of the questions, but as I've mentioned, uh, we will be reviewing these questions and seeing um, what we can collate together in terms of responses and, and share with um, all of you. And this brings us to a conclusion of our presentation today. I'd like to thank uh, Sandra, Callery, Boyce, Marufov, and Devin Metcalf for their presentations today. We really appreciate your time and sharing this great information on certification um, as well as IPAC surveillance. Additionally, I'd like to thank our panelists who assisted answering questions, and this included Jerry Hansen and Zahir Herji, as well as Jackie Sweetnam. I'd also like to thank my behind the scene colleagues who helped run this uh, webinar and the logistics, Natasha, Celestina, and Lane. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be responding uh, or we'll be drafting Q's and A's for what we haven't responded to or unable to respond to today and share that with the presentation and information of where this recording uh, will be posted. Um, I'd also like to make a plug that we do have another IPAC webinar scheduled on December 7th, co-hosted by the Ministry of Long-Term Care and Public Services Health and Safety Association on applying health and safety lens to IPAC and long-term care. So please stay tuned for a message with that. Thank you again for participating in our webinar. Uh, we hope you have found this very helpful and informative. Have a great day.